Welcome back. We are going to finish up chapter 12. This is the second video for chapter 12. There are more sampling methods. There's cluster and multi-stage sampling. Sometimes stratifying isn't practical and simple random sampling is difficult. Splitting the population into similar parts or clusters can make sampling more practical. Then we could select one or a few clusters at random and perform a census within each of them. This sampling design is called cluster sampling. If the cluster, if each cluster fairly represents the full population, uh, ugh, cluster sampling will give us an unbiased sample. But it's critical that each cluster is representative of the population. Cluster sampling is not the same as stratified sampling. We stratify to ensure that our sample, rep our sample represents different groups in the population and sample randomly within each stratum. Strata are internally homogeneous but differ from one another. So, for instance, if I wanted to make sure that there was proportional represent or equal representation of the various cl uh, classes as in, in freshman, sophomore, junior, senior at Houston Christian for a survey that I take about the new, you know, the food in the student center. Then if I wanted to make sure, like I said, I could do a simple random sample, but if I do a simple random sample, I run the risk of getting too many, um, like all freshmen. Well, they don't really have a historical basis to compare with, or I could end up with too many juniors, or I can end up with a bunch of seniors and my seniors don't eat on campus. So um, what I might want to do is do to stratify the whole student population according to their grade level and then do 25 freshmen, 25 sophomore, 25 junior, 25 senior. Clusters, on the other hand, are more or less alike. They are internally heterogeneous and each representing the overall population. We select clusters to make sampling more practical or affordable. And apparently the government does this a lot, especially if they're um, trying to study schools. What they'll do is they'll um, choose classroom, uh, like elementary schools. They'll choose 50 elementary schools across the state and then conduct whatever sampling they want want to do whatever surveying they want to do, they'll do for every teacher or every classroom within that school. Sometimes we use a variety of sampling methods together. Sampling schemes that combine several methods are called multi-stage samples. Most surveys conducted by professional polling organizations use some combination of stratified and cluster sampling as well as sample random sampling. So, for instance, like the government example I said, let's say they split up all the school districts, um, all the schools in, in the state of Texas into rural and urban. And so they decided that they're going to get, you know, half of the, the elementary schools are going to be from rural districts or rural areas and half are going to be from urban areas. So that would be stratifying. Okay, so they, they um, pick districts, let's say. They stratify and they pick, you know, 50, or that's probably too many, 10 rural districts and 10 um, urban districts. And then within those districts, let's say they pick three elementary schools out of those districts, and then they would sample every classroom in each of those schools. So they used stratification for the rural and urban, and then they use cluster by picking just a few schools and then sampling everything within it. So overall, that would be multi-stage sampling. Systematic samples. Sometimes we draw a sample by selecting individuals systematically. For example, if you might survey every tenth person on an alphabetical list of students. To make it random, you must start the systematic selection from a randomly selected individual. When there is no reason to believe that the order of the list could be associated in any way with the responses sought, systematic sampling can give a representative sample. Systematic sampling can be much less expensive than true random sampling. When you use a systematic sample, you need to justify the assumption that the systematic method is not associated with any of the measured variables, and sometimes that can be tricky. So this is typically not people's first choice of sampling methods. Okay, here's an example 
a, a, a kind of problem where you have to pick out what kind of sample. At Sumville High School, the administration wants to determine the student body's opinion about block scheduling. So the, determine the type of sampling being used in each of the following designs. So number one is select five of the 25 randomly assigned homes, homeroom classes and conduct a sample of each. Uh, conduct a census of each. Excuse me, that, that word is critical. Okay, so there's 25 homeroom classes and they're going to select five and then conduct a census within each one. That is cluster sampling. Census goes with cluster. So census and cluster. So that's a cluster sample. Obtain a list of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Randomly select 50 from each class. Combine to make your final sample. Well, we talked about something like that before. That is a stratified sample. Obtain an alphabetized list of students. Roll a die to determine this, a starting place. Choose the student corresponding to that number and every tenth student from that point on. That would be a systematic sample. All right, defining the who. The who of a survey can refer to different groups, and the resulting ambiguity can tell you a lot about the success of a study. To start, think about the population of interest. Often you'll find that this is not really a well-defined group. Even if the population is clear, it may not be a practical group to study. Second, you must specify the sampling frame. Usually the sampling frame is not the group you really want to know about. Um, you know, all, when people are doing um, polls, which are, um, you know, going to be samples and use surveys, when, when organizations are conducting polls, they want to sample the people who are actually going to go vote in the election. But they don't know that. You can't know that until election day. So they sample likely voters, which they get with certain criteria. They don't just do registered voters sometimes. Sometimes they do just registered voters. Sometimes they add some criteria, people who voted in the last presidential election, that sort of thing. And that's what they use for their sampling frame. But it's just their best estimate of the population of interest. The sampling frame limits what your survey can find out. Then there's your target sample. These are the individuals for whom you intend to measure responses. You're not likely to get responses from all of them. Non-response is a problem in many surveys. People just flat don't want to answer. Finally, there's your, your sample, the actual respondents. These are the individuals about whom you do get data and can draw conclusions. Unfortunately, they might not be representative of the sample, the sampling frame, or the population. At each step, the group we can study may be constrained further. The who keeps changing, and each constraint can introduce bias. A careful study should address the question of how well each group matches the population of interest. One of the main benefits of a simple random, of simple random sampling is that it never loses its sense of who's who. The who in, a, in an SRS is the population of interest from which we've drawn a representative sample. That's not always true for other kinds of samples. The valid survey. It isn't sufficient just to draw a sample and start asking questions. questions. A valid survey yields the information we are seeking about the population we are interested in. Before you set out to survey, ask yourself, what do I want to know? Am I asking the right respondents? Am I asking the right questions? What would I do with the answers if I had them? Would they address the things I want to know? These, are que these questions may sound obvious, but there are a number of pitfalls to avoid. Know what you want to know. Understand what you hope to learn and from whom you hope to learn it. Use the right frame. Be sure to have a suitable sampling frame. Tune your instrument. The survey instrument itself can be the source of errors. Too long yields less responses. Ask specific rather than general questions. Ask for quantitative results when possible. Be careful in phrasing questions. A respondent may not understand the question or may understand the question differently than the way the researcher intended it. Even subtle differences in phrasing can make a difference. Be careful in phrasing answers. It's often better a better idea to offer choices rather than inviting a free response. The best way to protect a survey from unanticipated measurement errors is to perform a pilot survey. A pilot is a trial run of a survey you eventually plan to give to a larger group. 
So what can go wrong or how to sample badly? Sample badly with volunteers. In a voluntary response sample, a large group of individuals is invited to respond, and all who do respond are counted. Voluntary response samples are almost always biased, and so conclusions drawn from them are almost always wrong. Voluntary response samples are often biased toward those who are strong, with strong opinions or those who are strongly motivated, and usually strong negative opinions because they're the ones who, who kind of have an ax to grind, if you've heard that, and just can't wait to express their opinion. And so it's worth it to them to make the effort to respond. If you're perfectly happy with things or kind of ambi you know, ambivalent about something, you're not likely to um, find it worth your time and effort to voluntarily agree to be part of a survey. Since the sample is not represented, representative, the resulting voluntary response bias invalidates the survey. Sample badly, but conveniently. In convenient sampling, we simply include the individuals who are convenient. Unfortunately, this group may not be representative of the population. Convenient sampling is not only a problem for students or beginning samplers. In fact, it is a widespread problem in the business world. The easiest people for a company to sample are its own customers. Sampling from a bad sampling frame. An SRS from an incomplete sampling frame introduces bias because the individuals included may differ from the ones not in the frame. Undercoverage. Many of these bad survey designs suffer from undercoverage in which some portion of the population is not sampled at all or has a smaller representation in the sample than it has in the population. Undercoverage can arise for a number of reasons, but is always a source of a potential source of bias. What else can go wrong? Watch out for non-respondents. A common and serious potential source of bias for most surveys is non-response bias. No survey succeeds in getting responses from everyone. The problem is that those who don't respond may differ from those who do, and they may differ on just the variables we care about. And if that's the case, if there's a systematic exclusion of um, a group of people who feel differently than the group of people who are included about whatever you're surveying, then you've got bias. Don't bore respondents with surveys that go on and on and on and on. Surveys that are too long are more likely to be refused, reducing the response rate and biasing all the results. Work hard to avoid influencing responses. Response bias refers to anything in this survey de design that influences the response. For example, the wording of a question can influence the responses. Look for biases in any survey you encounter before you collect the data. There's no way to recover from a biased sample of, of a survey that asked by or from a biased sample, and I think that should be, or a survey that asks biased questions. Okay, there's just no way to recover any of, any of that. Um, spend your time and resources reducing biases. Okay, you want good data. If you possibly can, pilot test your survey. That's critical. Always report your sampling methods in detail. That's just honest. That's the way to, to conduct a, a sample and, and a survey with integrity, which we always want to do. So that is your introduction to sampling. And you will work problems um, using this information next time in class.